in every house and you have different people moving in and out every week that a lot of neighborhoods may be against that. But if there's a way to encourage homeowners to rent out a room to college students or somebody that's 25 and working in town, that would open up hundreds and hundreds of rooms for rent. And inflation and rent are all driven by supply and demand. So if you can increase the supply of rooms, you're decreasing the demand, and rents will either hold flat or come down. The last I heard, there were a lot of restrictions or people talking about restrictions about houses letting, renting out their rooms. And I think that could be, in, instead of building hundreds of more homes and having the government have more and more control over everything, if we can encourage more open rooms from houses, I think we can accomplish the same thing without having to buy up more land and build low income housing or affordable housing, whatever you want to call it, and still resolve the problem. That was my thought about housing. Thank you, Mr. What? Your name as well? Uh, okay, I'm Stan Cole, I'm a local resident of the area. I, I came here to, you know, mention something to the city council, but it's a housing issue. Um, this is about the lamplighters. It got um, shut down because of, quote, uh, a map situation. I'm pretty sure most hotels uh, in this community, if they did a uh, careful uh, examination, would, could find traces of meth in them. The thing I was going to mention is that when I was working at one point on kind of a uh, work today, get paid today, uh, there was a woman and she had a relatively young son she was freaking out when she didn't get over 10 hours of work uh, that day because she was, um, if she didn't have that many hours, um, we wouldn't be able to stay in the hotel room. I think it was either the rank writer or the one near it. Um, so these, one of the things that the housing should really be concerned about is make sure we have more of these low-cost um, uh, hotel rooms in the community for people like this woman and her, her son. And I know this is something that um, is really hard because we got people that are you know, screaming about it. And what I was planning to say, and I said last time at the city council, is that these sort of things have to be put on a ballot because any council or public person that supports this sort of stuff, like in Fort Collins when they had got rid of a lot, they got rid of some of their regulations, and all the city council people were kicked out of office. And, and then, then fair housing stuff was kicked up, was uh, removed. So that's my two things, is that we need not just places where people can, oh, we can move in and start a family here, but when um, something doesn't work out in the relationship, and you have uh, a young son or something like that, and you have hardly any money. That is a critical need. Right? Thank you. Thank you, Stanley. Time is up. Seeing no one else, I'm going to close public event. You heard, I did miss a few of the revisions and submissions of projects. Do you have any uh, revisions to this agenda? No adoption. Uh, we're now in open new business resolution resolution 2023-28 management agreement for the property located at 12 336 uh, Road County Road 1. Okay, Ms. Adams, thank you so much.
Long Housing Director. Um, this, this item here has a, a long history behind it. Uh, the City Council in 2019 uh, did provide direction to staff to go ahead and use existing housing that is on land that was purchased for um, either open space or by water resources, particularly around Union Reservoir, but not exclusively, um, and use that for affordable rentals uh, rather than renting them out at market rate. And so that was in 2019, and the staff at the time started working on an MOU between what was then Public Works Natural Resources and Community Services to to go through the property, determine what was most appropriate for each one, and put together an MOU. COVID put the brakes on some of that for a while, but in the beginning of 2022, they did finalize that MOU between the two divisions, which now are, in effect, HCI and, and uh, Parks and Natural Resources all over the city. Um, so the first property on that list was the Newbie House, which has been rented by Habitat for Humanity for their AmeriCorps volunteers for the last several years. Um, and that has been going smoothly. They did some work on the house in exchange for um, lower rent rates. And then the second house is what we call the Adrian House. That's the one we're, we're looking at here. Um, it was over 100 years old. It was a two bedroom house. It was in need of lots and lots of repairs. And we, <clears throat> spent affordable housing fund dollars to rehab that since the HCI division does have a rehab program. And that work is now complete. All we're waiting for is final utility hookups, and then that house will be rent ready. Um, we renovated it to go from a two bedroom house to a four bedroom house. It has a two car garage, it has a yard, and it really is looking wonderful. And um, we are gonna be setting up tours as soon as we get the um, for everyone to see if they would like to. But now that the LHA and the city are in partnership and the HCI is very good at rehabs and the LHA, their core mission is um, property management and, and affordable rentals. So what you have here is a management agreement between the city and the LHA to manage that property um, and then uh, lease it out to a low income family which the lease is one of the exhibits on there, what that would look yeah. like. And the idea is we have people approved for four bedroom vouchers on our list that have been looking and can't find anything. So we would like to prioritize our voucher holders um, and, and get them in there as soon as we can. So this is a this is an interesting one because um, it's a, this is kind of a pilot program, right? It's similar to other things where um, open space or the water group have been using PMP property management to lease the, the homes before. So we kind of used that and modified it to be specific to what an LHA management agreement would need to include. Um, and so they're, they're still in review on that. They've generally agreed to all the terms, but we couldn't get um, the uh, open space, I'm sorry, park and, Parks and Natural Resources attorney to get it totally signed off ahead of this. So what we'd like to do is send this forward to you tonight. We are confident that we the issues to resolve, if any, are minor. And then we would have to bring it back to City Council anyways, because it's the lease of city property. That would have to go through two readings. And so if we end up having to make any modifications as we finalize that last legal look, then we would uh, bring it forward at a council meeting and just that correction but we don't anticipate anything substantive as we wanted to uh, make sure we still brought it today in case you wanted to have any discussion on it in more depth so can I have a motion to move from the rules that are in place at every LHA property today. So the property manager for this property, for this property LHA property management staff would enforce those. Rules. So your team? Yes. Yeah, so HCI team, investment building, 
we have housing authority management, so this will be the housing authority side of the piece that's already built. Mm -hmm. Okay. This has been moved by Commissioner Waters, uh, seconded by Commissioner Lafoy. Uh, all Second. Uh -huh. Seconded by Commissioner Bond. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? That passes unanimously. As soon as we have final post, pre and post photos, I will bring those back to you as well so you can see what the house looks like. Resolution 2023 29 is an approval of permit accounts receivable write offs. So I'm covering this in Cooper Daniels' absence. Um, this is, you just had one of these come through last meeting, so it's kind of following the same um, order of business here. This current write-off is for $100,984.60, um, and these are just being sent to collections at this time. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, yes, one is met. Could I have a motion for resolution 2023-29? I need the optimist with it. It's been um, approved by uh, Commissioner Martin, seconded by Commissioner McCoy. I do have a question. What is the um, main reason for the write-off? I know one of them was met. Mm -hmm. And I think they're both met as well, actually, oh, okay. because those the 108 was um, that's when we found the pipe after it was vacated. Okay. Yep, these are these are both on the prior met list, but they're um, cleaned up at this point. All right, so um, can I ask for a vote? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? That passes unanimously. Now we're at C, resolution 2023-30, approval of the execution of construction contract for the Village on Main Rehabilitation Project with Capers Construction Company. I'll be taking this item. Um, the day has come where we are signing construction contracts for the Village on Main Rehabilitation that will start work in January. Um, this, these, it's two exhibits, and if you aren't very familiar with these types of architecture contracts, they're not often used for city um, vertical builds, but it is the standard in the LIHTC world. And so you'll see what looks like a bunch of tech changes that looks like a draft, but that's actually the final contract. It's just modifications to the template language. Um, what's unique about this one this time is this isn't the final construction cost. That comes in the, um, the guaranteed maximum price contract later, which comes just about before closing. What this one is, is agreeing all to the um, general terms and authorizing um, a certain value of pre-purchase. So for specifically, we have a 72 week lead time on electrical panels, and we wanna make sure that um, we order that in time to be during our construction period. We also would like to do a demonstration unit um, ahead of time so that the residents can see what it would look like. So one of these um, construction contracts, the A133, does allow for that pre-work ahead of guaranteeing the maximum price. So it's just worked up to a certain core value that's being authorized. Okay. Could I have a motion to approve the resolution 
I have a motion for resolution 
not awarded the tax credit application in November, then we're going to wait and submit again in August. So there's going to be a point where it really will be the award of the tax credit is the trigger that's going to take place. So can I have a motion for the I would approve all the budget modification and other process. I'll second. We move by Commissioner um, Rodriguez, seconded by Commissioner Hidalgo for any um, criteria and discussion. Molly, um, just out of curiosity, you sounds like we're winning a lot of money. Um, what is going to be left to the, in our general fund um, with all of this? What will our fund balance be at the end of the year? Yeah. Uh, I think Kendra's running projections because she's prepping the beginnings of the 2024 budget right now. Um, and so I think that I can get that answer for you, but she's got a lot of things, reports running right now that project that out. Yeah, I mean, so when you look at the, the numbers related to um, village, mm -hmm. that, that's essentially a wash at the end of the year because it closes in at the end of the year, the expended. So we're all talking. So it really is the hundred thousand. Yeah, one fifty. One fifty. So I think the. Financial part of the this month too. Um, the third quarter. Uh, so we're looking at current assets, three million of unrestricted cash, a million of restricted. Um, and what we haven't going in there is the additional half a million. So if you look at it just from the Center for People with Disabilities, um, if we had to expend <coughs> 15, we would net 350 in additional revenue coming in instead of probably the easiest way to look at it if the other two are washing each other out. Okay. So you'd still see a revenue in the uh, with the sale of that building. Can't really fix those. Yeah, there there are our um, our quarterly financials are attached here. And so I'm seeing that generally each property is showing net income overall with a couple of minor Small number changes there. We can definitely get a um, more comprehensive summary to you as soon as Kendra returns. Yeah, as soon as she's done with the conference. So let's vote then. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Uh, all those, uh, excuse me, opposed. Seeing none, this passes. Now an LHDC asset transfer update and charitable organization on public works. So, um, when the city was first coming on with LHA in partnership, we did engage, or the, the, the LHDC, I should say, engaged um, an attorney to look at the LHDC organization, how that fits in with LHA and what the ideal structure should be and, and various related things. Um, the LHDC board has shown over time, there are currently three members, and the at the time in 2020 and 2021, there wasn't a lot going on in the development side and they were looking for purpose, I'd say. And it felt like that they should dissolve if there wasn't much of a purpose for them and that's what they desired to do. Um, the opinion issued by um, a, a tax credit attorney that we work with a lot um, said that it would be financially a good decision to absorb the LHDC asset, assets into the LHA. 
um, with one caveat that they might run into a related party debt issue, which I'll get to in a moment. So we uh, took that direction and started working with the attorneys, trying to research which for each property, what would it take to transfer the asset to LHA, um, and just really get a plan going, which we've reported to you before. Um, so since then, we've actually completed one of the transfers because the land, the Hoover land, got moved over to LHA for the for the ascent project, and then Village Place will be taken care of with the resyndication. So that'll be done by the end of the year. So then the ones left are Spring Creek, Fall River, Hearthstone Lodge, and Chrisman One, which we don't yet have ownership of, but we're on that partnership structure for LHDCS. Um, so the when doing the research, first of all, Hearthstone and Lodge are kind of their own animal. We have to do that exit that HUD 202 program. So we started working with HUD to kick that process off and see what it was going to take. Um, it is essentially a development project because you will be um, uh, refinancing loans, most likely putting a rehab in with it because you have that, that uh, cash infusion to be able to do that with a loan. And also tying it very closely um, with the HUD budget approval for those properties. It has to be, basically, you have to make it to a certain point within 90 days of your budget approval. It's a very structured process. So we knew that in 2023, we weren't going to make that because that was those budgets were due here this month. Um, and so we're shooting on as, as that is a 2024 project, unless we end up wanting to do a rehab that's more sizable. We need to plan that out. It may be 2025. But that is kind of what that those set of properties would need to get transferred out of the 202 and then really into the LHA side of things. Um, Spring Creek, Fall River, and Chrisman 1, um, well, let me, I'll break them up. Spring Creek, it is possible to go ahead and swap out the LHDC entity with LHA and move that over. What that really takes is um, a fair amount of attorney's fees and you really have to get consent from all the tax credit investors and lenders and there's a waterfall and. It takes, it's a process, but it's doable, and we are gonna go ahead and pursue doing that, but just not in a huge rush at the moment. Um, bottom line is because Fall River is the real interesting one that is making LHDC want to stay on from this point on. Uh, first of all, the related party debt issue is coming forward on Fall River, and that means in order to transfer LHDC off of the partnership structure, we would have to bring in another 501c3 or a different an independent community partner. So that could be Boulder County Housing Authority. It could be Thistle. Um, they would own 21% of the LHDC's current interest in the partnership. And we would have to do that or else we would be running afoul of the, the whole deal. So we presented that to LHDC last month. They agreed that that is not desirable. We would rather keep it in our own system and because now that we do have development coming and they do have um, a way to use their expertise and, and fulfill that purpose, they want to stay on. Um, and so specifically for Fall River, because we won't be able to really touch that until resyndication and since it just finished construction in 2020, that won't be till at least 2035. Um, so that is kind of prompting LHDC to stay on with us. They are interested in development still. And then um, there's another purpose that I'm gonna get to in a moment that we're considering for them as well. But first, the last property, Christman 2. Um, this one is currently LHDC's uh, entity is set up as a corporation, which is taxable. We're not sure why that was done that way, but it's not ideal. And so we're gonna move ahead with that one as well. Um, transferring it over to get LHA on and change it to an LLC, a non-taxable entity. So moving forward with Christman 1 Spring Creek, Fall River is staying in, Hearthstone and Lodge would move eventually with that 202. So basically when you um, self-perform in the way that we did at Fall River, under the tax law it requires you to have this ancillary so that's the way that was funded, which basically says, unless you bring another group in that performs the same function, you have to wait until the recertification period, way out in time. And either you could go, go to Boulder County or go to Thistle, or you would have to create 
the same practice structure. So it just kind of made sense that if you have the structure, you can do it. But that's just, that's what occurs when you sell fill, sell finance. What's different, this is what Christman we didn't understand because Christman is very similar to the approach that we took on Christman 2, the approach that we're taking on Zinnia, and the approach that we're taking on, on Holbrook, which in that scenario, don't need to set it up the way they set it up, which actually has tax implications, which makes it cleaner to, to remove that and shift that in. But Fall River is sort of that hanging piece. There's not much we can do with it based on the way that it's financed. Um, so that created a, a bit of a different issue for us. Um, and that was part of the legal work that we were uncovering on this. So it's, it's a different process. Let me just read a statement. HBC in, in their portfolio, 21% ownership um, of Fall River is part of their, is, is an asset yes. in LHDC. Mm -hmm. if, if LHD is going to dissolve, uh, they're obligated to, to award or assign those assets to Adam and Mike Bob. Yeah. And they can't assign those to LHA? No, it has to be a, it cannot be related part. And so it's not a cash, it's a, it's a, it's a physical asset or it's right. a, a, an ownership. Mm -hmm. So the, the, you might be able to find somebody else, or is there some reason it's only Thistle, Boulder County, or... So it, it can be another housing authority, as long as it's not out of the LHA. But it has right. to be a housing authority. Housing authority or a 501c4. Or a non-profit. Because of mm -hmm. how it's, because of the tax credit? Tax law. The related part of it. Exactly. So, so, so rather than... I would want us. I would be. I'd go. I would be opposed to assigning twenty twenty percent ownership of Fall River to the county or the Thistle or their. Mm -hmm. That was our perspective mm -hmm. all along. Mm -hmm. So that's so I see continues continues on, and then maybe another role for them as well. Right. Yeah. So is there any other questions about this piece, and then I'll move on to this other role that we are considering? Mm -hmm. So uh, this is kind of new. Is LHDC involved in our new project, Ascend, Cobra, uh, Christmas? Yeah. Or the money in it? Uh, they provided funding, but it's all through LHA. And LHA okay. is on the, okay. the entity on the ownership section. Okay. Well, and that's that's the difference in how we're building these projects. Is we're, we're not self-performing, self-funded. Mm -hmm. right. And so we have the other partner, which really takes away the related party issue that, that occurred in Fall River. And because we're, the LHA is actually, is in the LLCs that we talked about, the work that's where they're sitting in. And, and that's the potential distinction, right? I, I, think, I think you're right. I think it's, I, my brain was on the last question a little bit, but I, I think the reason it needed to be something like this all is that you want it to be an organization so they don't just get their ownership interest in holding the interest of the rest of the time. Uh, but I think otherwise, it's not going to be So the, the traditional role of, of a housing development corporation is they come in and they do the development, and then they're on the entity, the ownership structure, and then when you resyndicate, and you're not pulling as much, you're just refinancing loans, essentially, you're not necessarily always having to pull in a large um, amount of funding to do it from scratch, then tr traditionally, if you're self-performing and LHDC plays that upfront role, at resyndication they transfer it into LHA, which is exactly what happened to Aspen Meadows before we started this model with bringing in partners. And we still self-perform. We're self-performing Village Voice as well. Yeah, self-performing side, as we're shifting. It's the same issue that inhibited the development of projects, because you were limited financially what you we've been interested in as staff for a long time is um, considering we need an, we need some way to accept donations. Right now we accept donations of um, you know, 
supplies or materials or that type of thing, physical goods, but we do not, the LHA does not have a mechanism to accept financial contributions in the form of a donation. Um, other housing authorities do. So Boulder Housing Partners has a, um, a BHP foundation that is targeted towards providing resident services, and they do a lot of um, family work and children, accessing children to resources and that type of thing. BCHA also has a foundation, and so we've had a need for a long time, and we can see that continuing and growing. Um, if LHA had a way to accept donations for our resident services or for development, one or the other or both, we could have two separate funds. But the LHDC, because they're already set up as a 501c3 nonprofit, we could use the LHDC as that foundation arm to benefit the residents of LHA. And so we were talking to them about um, what that might look like. They are interested. We've spoken to our advisors board. Um, one of our new advisory board members is um, a community banker and does a lot of life tech work. And he is offering up some resources just to, to get started and figure out what that could look like. And so that's something that we'd like um, to run through LHDC and there's some more interest there. I have a question um, that I do have a, a perspective. I don't know if now is the right time or during council or our commissioner comments. Uh, if it's from Home Ahead, which is a nonprofit, but I think it's housing unit. I, I, I cross paths with them. Their mission, it's a relatively non nonprofit, their mission is to collect furniture, like people downsizing or whatever they need. They collect furniture and, and then donate it to folks who have moved into housing, who now have a home, but don't have furniture in the front. Mm -hmm. uh, and I feel my kids were just briefly about this. I was just curious, how many of our LHA residents would find themselves in that situation and make sure they are in their life, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, should, should we want to do this at the end, or do this? I think it makes sense now, because this could, you know, I have to just that back quickly, yeah. but I think how that could interplay with the foundation and how they're Yeah, I, my only, I had one conversation and said, why don't you send me your information so I can share it with either us as a council or us as a, uh, as commissioners based on what LHA's interest might in be. Um, they collect, their biggest challenge is, to, is, is not getting furniture, it's where to put it. Right. Right? They don't have a place to store it, right? But they'll collect it, they'll store it, and they'll help get it delivered and set up for people on campus. So it just seems to me it's something we ought to at least consider. Um, I will say that we kind of started this ad hoc on our own because we've had some residents pass away and their families just uh, give up possession of units in the LHA and don't want to deal with anything. And we definitely have people coming in at the suites without dishes, without just the basics, bedding. And so because the suites has so much storage space, we've been pulling it over and creating our own little donation center. It's all internal. Um, it's not accepting anything external at this point, but there is a, a clear need, and we can. This I'll, is if, if, in line. If with it's us. okay, I'm happy to do an email and connect you, I guess, mm -hmm. or you and me and Joan, whatever the whatever the right combination would be, just to learn more about where they are and where the members and opportunity for us. Yeah, because what I'm thinking about is the space needs. If LHDC has a foundation, and somebody donated space to the foundation. And the foundation could invest in a tax yeah. reduction or for them a reduction for them. That then space could be partnered with them so they could use it to store the stuff and then they set up the homes and that reduces the operational burden. Right. But where's, I mean, there's a way this can yeah. work. Thumbs up. So, what is this just informational for you? It is. Um, we have not delved in other than we need to figure out it, it because the entity is already created, it might just be an accounting function that we need to add, but then also 
you know, because of the website, and we should we need to plan around it. Um, and then if LHDC is the entity, then the official approvals will go through there. But if it's for the benefit of LHA, we'll kind of see what how that ends up playing together. We're a family member of yours each other in terms of how it works, but we didn't want to spend a lot of time on this and outline commission's headlights. And you were like, no, we don't want to. Did you send us um, a document of who is on the LHDC board or who, is, who are the entities there? We can send it. It's a three-person three person board. Three-person? Mm -hmm. We do have the contact list. Is that okay to ask for that? Yeah. Okay. I can, um, I'm curious. You're a vet. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've got Eris. Do you want uh, LHA to continue with this? Yeah, I would, I would hate to assign 21% ownership that this will count as part of the Yeah, I think we should say it. So this is kind of a, just an informational item on some of the, just an example of the ways that the city and LHJ partnership are really benefiting both um, uh, both organizations. So the, I've got my notes here. Um, so the LHA could use some trucks. We've been paying for private snow removal service that has, uh, we've talked about in, the, in this meeting before, it's breaking by. Um, it's just very expensive every single time. And our staff is going out and redoing what they do anyway to make sure it's meeting the needs of what the residents are, are expecting or, or what their needs really are for safety reasons. So we've been talking with police services um, to see if we could purchase a city vehicle that was um, going off the, you know, would be going to auction otherwise. And so um, we've worked out Plan with them and with purchasing to purchase a truck um, and a sander so that we could do our own snow removal and that is happening as we speak it's, all, it's within budget so there's no budget modification or special request necessary um, but the total cost of that is about thousand dollars I'm sorry ten thousand the first the first truck is eight thousand five thousand dollars Maintenance is two thousand. Fuel is seven thousand, uh, and that includes the sander and some brake gates. And then we will have an annual replacement cost of around if that change Friday eighteen thousand uh, dollars. That's all within budget, and that lets us replace um, that truck in five years for a new truck. Um, so the total cost is this year is thirty thousand eight sixty seven, and then the ongoing component of that in future years is twenty two thousand, um, and that roughly twenty two thousand. What is the ongoing component? Fuel maintenance and then the uh, replacement cost. Mm -hmm. We're advertising that. Yep. So working with fleet services to help them manage that. There's a second truck that we're looking at doing it, uh, utilizing. That's probably going to be next year. Um, we, we do find a way to finance it for the budget in this scenario, but our fleet order trucks got canceled uh, a month or so ago, and so we can't get the truck that we were going to get until the new trucks come in. So it's probably going to be a delay until next year, but we'll go ahead and bring the second truck in. Um, Included in that is also a, uh, I call it uh, a utility, you know, the little vehicles that you see that's also included um, that we use on sidewalks. We're going to have one of those purchased with the trailer so that we can do all the sidewalks. And 
and you found out that those things can go all the way across town, and so it may not necessarily need a trailer, so we may have two people doing those things. But what this is going to mean at the end of the day, even for one truck or maybe even two, is that that's going to reduce the operating cost of each one of these properties. And so what that allows us to do is then probably more aggressively try to let the mediation times that we started, and it's also going to allow us to find capital replacement and also maybe get some of the services and some of these. So, I mean, it's going to be a net savings, and then there will be some administrative costs that will flow into the general fund associated. $30,000 of expense, which is, which is an offset of say, in terms of current, current expense. You contract it, it out now. I mean, so if it's last snow season, we paid over $200,000. And the, you know, that. So is it going to reduce all that, or some, is you still going to contract some of that out? No. So it saves all that? Yeah. Do you have to hire somebody or? No, because our maintenance staff have been. So here's the other problem with it. We would have snow removal companies come out and our maintenance staff would have to do it anyway because the, either they weren't getting there soon enough or they it wasn't what was needed. And so we're going to use the maintenance staff and call them to do our maintenance. But basically we're going to account for, for their time based on buildings. So if um, we use Dave and Dave's attached to Spring Creek, Instead of having that offset on building, we'll bring I guess what's the name now? Randy. Randy. And Randy will go to Spring Creek so that we can account for the already encumbered maintenance dollars that we're doing this. And so there may be some minor overtime expenses, but nothing that we're going to have to add personnel. Now, all that being said, um, as we start moving into ag facilities, we are going to add maintenance personnel into these facilities. So, you know, I, I would say, if I look at it in, in a really conservative, thinking you know, unanticipated things that could happen, you know, probably no less than $100,000 savings. Um, if we really wanted to push it, I think we could be somewhere in the neighborhood in aggregate of 160000 and that'll vary by property, because we have to apportion it by space. So properties with larger parking areas, more sidewalks, will save more than properties in smaller areas. Is, is the truck that you're getting the first one? Excuse me, is it a plow-in shelter? Yep, it's one that we already. It's one that does that work currently. Okay. And it's in good shape. We've seen it actually, and they delivered it to us before we title transferred. So they send it back until we get all the title transfer. <coughs> and so it's been performing that um, across the city now. And we know that the condition will last three to five years. Yes. And fleet will still be doing the maintenance on it. Well, that's going to be part of the IGA. Okay. Thank you. I just want to say I remember when I first started that on from that's what right. so this is beautiful to me um because i couldn't understand how we spent contracted that much out um whereas most housing authorities are using maintenance um to do that that work and so so of course that makes me happy <laughs> yes. yes and then we know we did the executive director's report and then the development efforts um so I'm going to have Molly start off with the development updates because that's going to transition into a piece of my report that you are going to hear as the Housing Authority Commissioners, but you're really going to hear it as the Council, but I think in terms of the Housing Authority world, it's probably more important that you hear it to understand what that really means to us developing more projects. So, you want to start on that? Yep. So uh, we really are just moving along on the Hover project, Village on Main project. Everything is just rolling. Um, for Hover, we are slowing down, waiting for tax credit, but we still are working on design, just not full bore. Um, everything's just moving on Village on Main. Uh, we are ahead of schedule, and so we're just getting, making sure we have all of our ducks in a row and anticipate everything. Um, what I really wanted to show you tonight is some updates on the Recovery Cafe, because we now have 
a potential rendering of the village, I'm sorry, recovery cafe um, located at the suites. So here's where we are in this project. Um, the feasibility study has been completed. Uh, it is feasible in terms of it, it can be permitted, the utilities we can work out. Um, it will be quite a project to get all of the suites investors and lenders um, to consent to everything, but we just went through that on Zinnia. We kind of know how that would go. Probably navigate along like a snake, but we'll get there. Um, none of them so far have said that they think that this is a bad idea. It's just how do you make sure that our um, existing deal doesn't, doesn't get impacted. Um, so the Recovery Cafe Board is considering this tomorrow night, whether they want to keep moving forward. So we'll report back on how that goes. Um, the cost estimate, they have a pretty detailed cost estimate on what this would cost at this point. And it's, it's about a five to six million dollar building. Um, so they are going to be discussing capital campaigns and their financing options and they're already going to be applying for worthy cause and there are a lot of things in the works. But so we're moving from the project is feasible to now what does, what does this look like financially? Um, and so we are funding their design to date with our CDBG COVID money. And we do have ARPA funds tagged for this as well. And so once we get word that they are moving forward, they are gathering um, resources, then we can go ahead and contact that ARPA funding out if everything looks like it is, is a go. Um, I just wanted to share these because this just came out from their architect. So what I really like about this one is that here's the suites, mm -hmm. which we know the suites looks, it's, it's not the most attractive building in the world. But when you put this in front of it, it does look like it's kind of an intentional look, I think. Um, but it's very welcoming. This is the, right here is the cul-de-sac. Mm -hmm. And so it would have a, like a storefront look at that cul-de-sac and be more, more inviting. Mm -hmm. um, and here's kind of what they are showing in the, in the, in the, in the uh, middle area. So I just wanted to give an update that we have reached a milestone project is feasible. Good. Now they need to um, come up with their plan for the financing of this. And so that's what we'll be reporting back to you all on as we go forward. I think part of the conversation with the investor is the most significant issue that we face at the suites is people dealing with the pain. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also know that struggle with recovery are because of mental health issues. Mm -hmm. And having this kind of facility at this location, I think when you look at the long-term viability of their asset, the protection of their asset, is that the more we can have this available at the facility, we think the more successful not only this facility, but Zinnia will be yeah. because we, we just know what issues we're dealing with. And so we talked about this with you all before, but you know, this is, I think, pretty important for both of these projects in terms of having successful projects. I totally agree. I mean, you know, having on-site help, you know, and that would be nice in the future if we could have mental health there as well, so that they can work together. So that's part of what we're thinking. So um, we have the supportive services position that we're monitoring and working on on that. We have uh, that person to get, you know, we're, we're also, I think, rethinking that position and the fact that we need people that really can deal with the traumatic situation versus traditional um, social service work because it's a different world. Um, and you know, one of the things that there was a question previously about you know what we're doing on that house. I think part of it is the relationship because of Sarah and Zach that we're now having with Lucy Floor and the conversations that we're having with mental health partners is we've actually some progress in terms of how we share information, how we come together to support the individuals, because we were so compartmentalized, it was hard for any of us to get into. So this is just an evolution, I think, from that, that we have more work to do. Yep. What I was going to talk to you about is, as we start evaluating the projects and, and the goal that you all have for us in terms of six housing units and five years, I think is what it 
was. And, and so obviously, um, you're seeing a two under construction, um, hopefully over the third, and we have another one in, and we could have two in semester before. And then when we talk about the city project, which is, you know, the affordable attainable home ownership opportunity, that's five. Um, one of the, the biggest challenges that we're facing right now on the, on the housing authority side and the city side, because these are inherently connected. When we merged, we really looked at how do we take advantage of a project scale to actually produce more units. What we found is that it worked. What we've also found is we probably need to reach our limit in terms of our capacity and what we can and can't do. Um, and these positions also can generate income, revenue. And so, Katie, who you've seen in the, in the conversations, um, at some point in the, the mix in the group, and at, at different phases, there's different work, different people involved. It's the same people in every project. And so, at, at one point, we had Christmas starting construction, we were moving on Zinnia, and we started Hover, and we had Linda replace some syndication. And we asked Katie to go out, can you? It starts blinking, mm -hmm. and I'm going to try to keep this as separate and, and as separate as I can, but I can't because of the work that we're doing. Well, Katie, you know, in that work and meeting with Dola and our DOH, you know, we got 1.8 million for that project. Um, we can't keep this up, so as we began looking at how we approach it from a housing authority standpoint, knowing that in order to really make the housing authority more viable. Projects. Um, when we look at the work that we're doing on the affordable side and attainable side, obviously we need more projects. And, and so the only way that we think we can blend this is on the city side of it, um, we have our administrator expenses capped at 10%. We're looking at in order to produce more housing, like Zinni and these other projects, also home ownership opportunities. We need to move that cap to 20% to add an additional and bring the number all up full time. The reality of how the world's changed is when we originally created those funds, there were no revenue sources out there. Right. Now there are so many revenue sources out there for housing that we're almost at the point on both the housing authority side and the city side where we're not able to build for things just because we don't have static capacity to do it. And so the blend of this, and it may show itself in the housing authority budget and some of the city, is we really need to drive that administrative cap up. But we're pretty confident that we will, I mean, well, if you just look at this year, we're going to literally triple the value of one grant. And the thing that's also in play now is Prop 123 in the sense of how that can apply sell projects and then Hover is really going to be a test case that I think can cross cut into the middle income housing authority based on how they're looking at price points and looking at average income and prop 123. I think what we're going to be able to do is going to be much different in a year than it is now. We just don't have the staff. So no on both sides of the house this is going to be part of the budget. Um, to me it's so important what you will see on the problem the first presentation that we know of the council that early on in, in this process for the housing authority was that I'm leading with this in terms of what we can do. Uh, but it's really about generating units for the community. Mm -hmm. So the the ten percent according to twenty percent, ten percent administrative cost cap, ten percent of what? Of all of the funds that we have coming in that aren't um, Directed. So we put a million dollars into uh, the affordable housing fund. And so that 10% generated the where the money comes from. Cox expenditures at a what's the number as opposed to what you're saying? Um three hundred and sixty-four thousand at 
ten percent is the cap, and then you'll generally try to transfer at two hundred and six. You think twenty percent is where we need to be because I think Christian would salary increases. That would be seven hundred and twenty-nine thousand. Um, so it's it's about four hundred thousand dollars. And the assumption is we did your time to be reversed capacity. You've added capacity. And it's KD and someone else. Uh, and the capacity you're building is the capacity work to generate new work to secure new revenues for you. And build new, right. So that the, over time, the more you generate, you cap it at 20%. I guess that does go along with revenue sources. Well, and we build other revenue sources that are coming in on the housing authority side so as to get more um, um, administrative expenses by managing the facility. That starts boosting that revenue stream so that they can start contributing and do this at a different level. So it's, it's, you know, it's that flywheel. We're trying to keep that flywheel started so that we are ramping up our, our ability so we're more comparable to what you see in Fort Collins or even Boulder. Somewhere in that, is there a way to do it? I mean, Katie plus somewhere else, that's one thing. What about, what about buying back some of your time? Well, so, so, so part of it, and I'll be honest with you, so part of these two is actually buying back some of her time. Um, because right now, you know, as we look at this, um, if I look at it from the standpoint of I'm trying to fill needs from the bottom up because we're routinely finding issues. Like this year, it's a mini yard custodian. And, and that is part of the equation because the more we build in administrative expenses, it may not be that we can get an executive director, but we can get maybe an assistant director with Molly, but on the other side, this is going to relieve Molly of some work that she's having to do to assist Katie. And what I didn't say about Katie is Katie's turn on because we used ARPA funds to do it. So we know that the, the other issue is when the ARPA funds run out. And so the hard part within the broader, broader budgeting process is I can't budget an ongoing position unless I create reality is the number I gave you is 7.9. I don't need for the next two years because the ARPA dollars are going to continue to flow in. And so that lets us balance the overall system. And so actually it's a lower amount that's going to be coming in, but I have to set that funding in perpetuity. Okay. That in terms of the, the value of that kind of capacity you want to create in revenues and any kind of flywheel you want to control. Right. There's another part of this, and just and I'm, you know, just if, if you ever decided to leave, whoever sits on this council and this commission is going to have a hell of a job finding someone who can step into a role and manage a city and do what you're doing with that inventory. So some of the capacity that has to be built, it seems to me, and Greg, is part of succession planning. Agree. Yeah. And part of that is that's why I'm, I'm not. I'm not. No, no, no. I don't want you to go anywhere. I'm just saying. No. No. I hate to be on. I hate to be looking for somebody. Replace you to you know ever, but uh, you know so that's the same worry I have over yeah. here, right? And so I think part of it is is if I can relieve Molly, that Molly can have some you know there's some more succession planning to bring in place. And I'll just say for mental health, yeah. that ought to be part of the conversation yeah. going along. But yeah. Yeah. But for you and for Molly and for everybody else who's involved in this, thing, it's been a full court press. I get for since day one. And, um, and that's not probably sustainable long term. So as you're talking about building capacity, there, there's got to be a long view. Yeah, and, and, and that's again kind of where the blame comes in because if on the other side of the budget, if we weren't doing it, we were trying to figure out how to, how to get some support to help balance it. And both sides, and we're just limited this year. But I think for all of our mental health, mm -hmm. and, and right now, the, I'll just tell you the group that I'm the most concerned with is. Really are in profit advantage. Um, nobody has a clue for what they deal with on a daily basis, and and that's where we're focusing. Because there's a day. I mean, literally, we took a day where we, I, we had a meeting set up, and I just came in and said, "Let's go bowling." We, we need to relieve. We need to hit a pressure relief valve because uh, that works tough. And and I would say, but for Sarah and 
it's even working out at Forbes. And um, again, combination. Uh, there's something in the budget on the other side that's going to let us get more of Sarah, have Sarah help coordinate across the board on many of the issues we're dealing with. But it's connected to our two rooms um, because I can inject $50,000 into the system and actually get Sarah more freed up to do this stuff and create another name of service officer, which are apparently working support the same things. So you're now starting to see that interplay between both systems so that we can maximize what we can do. Mm -hmm. Did I cover everything? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Um, I, I, um, Nicole said that we had a 10% cap and now a 20% cap. And um, I guess what I'm asking is what's the reason for the term cap and what, what, what causes the constraints? That's actually the issue that we're circling back about all of these things is and we weren't, well, we were here on the attainable housing fund, but we never, we weren't here on the affordable, so we're not sure why. What most places do is just do a direct cost allocation, and we don't necessarily have a cap. I mean, that's another option is to say we're not going to cap it, we're just going to do a direct cost allocation that will be evaluated on an annual basis, which is probably financially the best way to go because you're always making decision based on the ROI. So it's not... It's not something like a, a state enterprise where it is self-imposed. Self that was where I was going. It might have been modeled out. CDBG has a statutory 20% cap on admin. Mm -hmm. And so when the Affordable Housing Fund was created in 2000 or so, um, that might have been a model to use at that time, but that was a totally different world. And by the way, our CDBG funds used to fund about a position and a half, and now they don't cover one full one. Just that CBG funds are going down and our, everything else is going up. Nothing else is going down. But yeah, we, we, we truly are at this intersection point that we want it to be at. Um, and it's kind of maddening at times. I mean, it took us a while to work through all of this and how we allocate it, but we figure out what to do with it. Um, but we can say unequivocally it's leading to the generation of more need. I think we've created more affordable housing units and, and that are in the pipeline that we probably have at any single point in time in the history of our community. So we know it works. It's just we need to keep doing it. That's my report. That was a good question. Mm -hmm. That's huge. Yeah. Thank you. I think we have Sarah next. <laughs> um, I think she's after after financial and property, which I'm covering, which means um, specifically for financials, this is a quarterly financial look. And if we have any specific questions, I can um, sort it through or ask Kendra for further information if we need it. So we've got the age receivables report, the monthly, monthly financials, and the voucher issuance account. So if anybody has any questions on those. questions all about um, the first two items on the voucher issuance count I do want to give some information on this one um, so Kendra started showing our the two-year tool in the packet for these quarterly updates that really does um, show us what our voucher capacity can look like over an estimated two-year period um, in this case 
you, you talked about this some, where Boulder, County Housing Authority and Boulder Housing Partners both increased their payment standard up to 110% of fair market rent. Um, and the, the question was, will we follow suit and do the same? And what we reported to you a couple months ago was that our, we're not showing that our voucher holders are having a tough time leasing up. And if we go up from 105, which is where we currently are, to 110, that reduces the number of vouchers that we can actually put out because we have a certain dollar value. And so we could either pay more for less people or less for more people. Um, so what you're showing on, what you can see on this two-year tool is that we're actually showing that we're going to um, kind of hold steady with where we are. Oh, it's actually, it's, it's slightly a reduction. That's our pro projection with this current HUD funding value and keeping pace at 105% of fair market rent. And that's um, really not what we want to do. We would like to increase our number of vouchers which means we need more funding from HUD. Um, we are about to give HUD a call and find out how come some of our other regional housing authorities have received additional voucher funding this year. We have not yet received it. Um, when we have shown now in our two-year tools for the last two years that we are managing this appropriately and we should have the authority to go higher. So um, we're gonna be having that conversation, but that's why on here you'll see that our two-year projection is at 410 vouchers, whereas currently we're in that 427 range. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so um, my question is, uh, have you asked uh, HUD to increase the vouchers previously? Or is this the first time you've ever asked? This is the first, it's not about the ask necessarily, but this is the first time the funding has been out there and we have met the thresholds that we should be they haven't met, remember, they've yet they didn't meet the performance requirements. Mm -hmm. And so this is where we finally have a record to show we're meeting the performance requirements. And not only is meeting it, but where it's resulting in a reduction potentially mm -hmm. in vouchers. And so um, we're going to start managing this. This is going to be managed weekly okay. if, in terms of what we're seeing come in and come out in terms of the two year tool. Um, so this is the first time I think we've been in a position mm -hmm. to say. Oh, yes. Sandy sitting at that meeting and this meeting, that is an opportunity to, to start talking about this. But yeah, this is the first time we, we were on the road last year, this year we're where we need to be. Mm -hmm. We're good. I'm glad you're pushing. Mm -hmm. So if you're, can I ask one more question you over there? If yeah. you're successful in whatever that challenge looks like, or inquiry or something, what does what does what does the dollar figure and the number of vouchers? How what would you, how would you determine that success? So we know. So let's take Boulder Housing Partners for example. We know that they have about double the size of our vouchers in their program, and they've received eight new vouchers that we heard for this this year. So understanding that we should be on par with them on performance, then if we received four new vouchers, that's a step. I mean, we were hoping for more than that, but um, I do think that that would be at least keeping pace with our partners. So is that 410 then? Is, you're talking about four, success is 414? Um, officially, but it depends on the dollar value because yeah. you can see what it's really, um, how much are we anticipated to increase over time as well in terms of future funding increases. So it would be 414 plus? Plus completely more growth. Dividing that into your number yes. to get you to put up the more value growth. of it. Um, well, and, and we haven't lost sight of the whole reporting issue either. Mm -hmm. We need to get some of this to the winter because that's another play that we're trying to wrap our mind around in terms of what that means. It's all tied together, certainly. Are there any other questions? I don't see any projection to move on to occupancy. So, 
Uh, so we're at 96%, which is a high for this year in those properties that we are actively um, filling because we do have a hold on uh, Briarwood and Village Place for um, getting a meth unit fixed and then also holding Village Place for the resuscitation project. Um, for your property updates, this is Lisa's update here. I'm not going to go over everyone in specifically, but I did want to highlight one thing. I, you can always uh, feel free to ask a question if you see anything on there, but I did want to share a good news story, and it's another, and I have permission to show this, um, it's another good story about how the city and LHA and how it all works together for the better. Um, so this is the son of a city staff member, um, and he is getting his Eagle Staff. Eagle Scout. And so the horseshoe pits at Spring Creek and Fall River were put in in that 2018 and 2020 period, but nobody has used them. And residents would rather have had um, raised garden beds, which we wanted to give them for a good year plus. And so he volunteered to do the garden beds for, as part of his Eagle Scout project. And so he's finished work and they're planting right now pumpkin seeds and things so they can have a fall harvest. So I thought that was a great example of just I mean, it's, it could have happened without the city as well, but it's just those connections. That, that kid it. built those? Yes. By himself? Um, I think he had some help, but <laughs> yes. yes. But he, but he led the charge. Part of the Eagle Scout, so it's just him. Yeah. 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 And they're also talking about doing, what, some bedding was to be right? Or to be being more of your Um. We have a lot of we have lots of ideas for things that are in the realm of the foundation that we are here for doing um, you know, what we can here and there, but certainly have people banging on the door trying to do more with us. So, so in uh, the other only other main update that I wanted to provide is that today was the last day for Corinne Lawson, our our um, community manager at the Sweets and the, the Aspens, and it was just a big loss because she was so wonderful. Um, she's very sad to leave it, but she did not want to. And so um, we do have some staff openings. We are listing, her position is listed, and um, we are looking for someone with more of the crisis management skills and de-escalation techniques and that type of thing. And then we have another assistant manager, assistant community manager posted and we've had a good interview so far. So we're hoping to be back up and just have a tiny blip on the radar of vacancy. I think that's probably the biggest change is when, you know, when we first started getting qualified applicants, you know, it was tough. I think we're now seeing qualified applicants. And from an organizational perspective, that's what people want because the reputation wasn't great. You know, just met people who want to apply. And that means if you're getting qualified, that means our reputation is improving. And so, you know, that's another side that I look for in terms of what it, how we're doing. Any other questions on the vacancy? I don't know if we talked about this. That happens in the update. So I just want to give you a quick recap um, on the last six months, I guess, working on the LHA. So um, attending all the coffee and conversations, I think you've really been able to accomplish a lot of the really small, you know, day to day, you know, issues that residents are having to the large issues that end up having public safety and the police come out to, to the property. So um, anywhere from dealing with some lighting and landscaping issues to parking lot problems to in, even neighborhood problems that out, are outliers but do affect our, our property. So um, I, I, we've been able to tackle them and, and really solve each one of them. And I actually had a compliment today from a gentleman at Spring Creek about the noise um, mitigation that we we're very creative about, and he is very pleased with our work. So um, he's the one that attended, I think, not last month, but the month before. So a lot of success versus versus uh, you know just kind of sitting on problems or it taking just too much time. Um, Michelle Goldman's finally we finally got her pinned down to come in August September to talk to the uh, our senior properties on evacuations and. We did get more signage up for folks to feel more comfortable about that. So that will be coming up. Um, 
we recently had some debacle about the gazebo in front of Village Place with, mm -hmm. with LBDA. Had a meeting about that. I'm getting quotes uh, to the discussion is we need to maintain the bank due to the ongoing, I mean, years and years of problems with that gazebo. So it will be taken down. Just using the name property. Correct. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, and then it just not being maintained. And the question was like, well, who's maintaining it? LBDA thought LHA was doing it, and the contract was from 1989. So mm -hmm. we're we're basically smoothing that over. We're going to take the gazebo down and make it make additional parking there, which won't add a ton, but it will add a few spots. And that was actually a complaint from the residents about the activities mm -hmm. that were that gazebo actually became more of an attractive. Then, um, last but not least, uh, the meth detector. So we're still we're still doing, you know, we're still following them. The data is reading consistent, so we know that they're working. As far as right now, they're at a low of between like a four and a sixteen, which means that we have no no meth, mm -hmm. um, which is a good thing. Where they are. Um, I was going to say they're 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 not they're not they're 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 they are 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 trying to be cautious before we, we move forward and, and figure out that maybe they just they weren't all they say that they were going to be. So I think we're going to try to put them in some, to some clean units soon. The ones we have. Them through the roof, like they can. Like roofs. However, we're having to replace them about every week. Oh. And, that, oh, yeah. and I, I should have said that. Like Correct. Yeah. 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 And then it's the amount of time you have the sensor, you know, basically scan the air. But yeah. even then, we're we're fine. They're they're telling us it lasts up to six months, but we're not seeing that with the numbers that that, <laughs> that we're finding. So that is our next conversation. So what kind of what kind of, of batteries are they? Just a lithium battery, like a uh, double A double A double A, 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 a lithium, like the kind they recommend smoke detector correct but it's a this is an active so it's doing two things it's pulling it in and then it's communicating via a cell signal mm -hmm. and so they're not lasting as long as they're supposed to and we're greedy so they're not here as the battery dies the, so when the battery dies it totally goes offline mm -hmm. so we can see that mm -hmm. okay and do so, they stay consistent well they, so far um, when, when they're operable, we are seeing consistent, and it, they're being read every, well, we've asked for the time to be changed a little bit, but the timing is like about every hour to every maybe two hours, mm -hmm. and we have two of them, so. We have three. We also learned a lot about which batteries to use. Mm -hmm. um, we now know that the case is fireproof. Um, uh, we had some that batteries from New Zealand, New Zealand that we're not ever using again. Um, and so, but it, again, that's why we want that's why we're learning through this, right? So we now know that issue. Um, and, and so some questions that result, does it work? Yeah, it works. The battery's neck. And so we're going to, as Sarah said, try to talk to them about how we approach those. But we're at the point where it's worth the test and some Just a little surprised with technology years ago that uh, in so many houses that have hardwired uh, uh, you know, fire detection systems that they didn't have that component. Uh, that was just good idea. Yeah. It's it. It seems like every time we do have a conversation, there's something new. They're evolving quickly. Sending us the newest 
test mm -hmm. model, right? So I believe the next model we get um, will be updated to a normal test. Mm -hmm. So hopefully. I think, I think Sarah's their RIP. <laughs> I <know>. <laughs> <laughs> Especially for building a U.S. market, I mean, there's, there's some real things to sort out across international boundaries. that does use them and we have some we have been communicating back and forth and that's the last email that I sent to her was hey what are you doing because we are just figuring this battery thing out so mm -hmm. I've asked her what they're doing and I've yet to hear back but um, we're trying to communicate with the folks that do use them mm -hmm. they do have the a different outlet adapt we do need an adapter they use a type one plug okay. that's why I was wondering if they like you know it's also Well, we're in the realm of lineage with Silvos, and so that was one of the first things they had to correct is um, working out what the SIM cards. So we had so many SIM cards to install them because they're hard installed, and so that that's the RIP part. I mean, there is this growing. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's all I have. Any so questions? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the safety as well. Um, I sent you a voicemail of a gentleman who said that he was Section 8. You know that voicemail when you were going to look to see if he was an LHA. Um, I'll forget his name if you want us. Um, somebody that is. Well, it's like a, yeah, yeah that is something that we can't talk about. Okay. Yes. Um, I just want to say that. Um, you know, as we were talking about Harold, about mental health and staff and everything, and then also um, your time. Um, the last time we spoke, due to the fires and everything in Hawaii, mm -hmm. um, one of Harold's desire is to go out and to Hawaii and um, assist and learn and teach at the same time, but um, not having that opportunity to be able to go out to do that, I think it is important for our city manager to go out to something like that and see what he can learn, but I don't know if he has the capabilities of being able to do that, and I don't know what the rest of the uh, commissioners think or slash counselor uh, think about that, and I don't think he would have ever brought it up, but that was something that he was passionate about uh, doing. I don't know if any city managers have ever done that before. Um, I know city managers have gone to other cities, jurisdictions, states mm -hmm. to learn mm -hmm. on, on all types of different issues. But with what we may be experiencing here, mm -hmm. I think it would be, I'm sure Ashley's local would have loved to go someplace before it hit her town mm -hmm. um, to learn what's happening and how do we manage this. Part of it is a figuring out family stuff and other things mm -hmm. too, but yeah, um, backups. And mm -hmm. I can work remotely too. The interesting piece was I actually had you all wanted me to schedule my vacation. Well, yeah, that's I where know. I schedule my vacation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> it seems like there's a certain amount of waiting to see what the results are. Maybe in the vision, but it seems like a large.
this too that the U.S. has more than resources. California, Hawaii. Yeah. California, Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's pretty much Hawaii. So, I mean, I would, I would think that Herald and Herald would be needed as much aid in rebuilding as the Warner. But, yeah, I think being a more precipice of something and watching how they saw it. <laughs> well, we're trying to figure it out right now because obviously I'm on vacation set, so we're watching it closely. But um, yeah. Um, yeah, part of it is I've unfortunately had my share of natural disasters mm-hmm. over my yeah. career. So he doesn't go to the city council. Especially before November. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. <laughs> Any other comments? Um, the word hasn't whispered around the table yet. Um, the uh, town commissioners have decided that they will accept the that they will terminate the conservation easement on Hanmar Estates, mm-hmm. and uh, I think that they reserve the right. We have to annex it before the easement is actually terminated so they've got this little hook going on but were there any conditions put on it other than um, the annexation uh, the uh, the commitment that uh, Jack Vestal has made to keep the uh, affordable to, to keep the for sale um, deals here mm-hmm. at least at the first sale and they're they're angling for more they're they're, they're wanting uh, Longmont to do something about some shorter deed restrictions to keep the uh, middle tier middle tier for at least a little while, mm-hmm. uh, but I don't think that is a condition. So speaking of that, what we're finding in the state funding and everything we've talked to you about is um, they are looking at deed restrictions, um, and I think that's going to be about a ten-year requirement is what they're looking for, and so we're toying with some concepts of. Rolling kind of component in that if you sell it before 10 years, then the next person coming in has to meet the requirement and then they have 10 years. Mm-hmm. And then, but if you live in it to your run, then you can sell it before your equity. Obviously, with some equity escalator grant, you can, part of it's about building wealth too. Mm-hmm. So that you can move into it. Mm-hmm. But we, yeah. we actually ran into that. It's on the Ironwood grant. On the Ironwood grant in terms of the 10 year piece. So if you go in and you get any of the state dollars, which I would expect you don't have to, they'll definitely affordable for sale to obtain what there's going to be a requirement for the state to do that. So these affordables are habitat, so they're probably already plugged into that. But um, yeah, because yeah. that's different because habitat subsidizes the cost of the house. Mm-hmm. And so that's. <laughs> So with this is is that a conditional thing once you pay money? Um, we haven't seen they haven't made it as far as to create any of those actual grant agreements yet, but the same group doing it, um, it's coming out of the same shop and that's so far showing us a ten year. Um, so we actually get Root is providing us tomorrow our mini report on what our deed restrictions for attainable housing look across the state right now. So we can get some numbers to see if what it just looks like out there in the market. Did uh, the one two three group also um, craft the two thirteen? Mm-hmm. Did you still bring mm-hmm. that? There was <laughs> probably so there was some probably some overlap in that. Okay. But the problem is they didn't create any rules. So the rules are now going to be created out of for yeah. home ownership out of Department of Housing. So they're not mm-hmm. out of Chapa. No the economic Oh, edit. Oh, edit. Chaplin. And Chaplin. Uh, Office of Economic Development and International Trade. They have the, the figure, they have the rental piece with Chaplin. But 
we just seeing it kind of we're going to attach to the district. Oh, yes. Yes, the education of the restrictions and we have to figure out what they say because they always say they're not going to be at the meeting. But you also say the routine is how much fun it is. Yeah, we build equity gains mm -hmm. in yeah. that too. Exactly. If we, if we figure out how to say that. But I don't know. So, you had a motion to adjourn. So moved. I, 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 I,